Texas speaker event. I'm Portia. Um, I'm sure you've been before. I'm glad that you all were able to make it. I'm um, here to introduce to you uh, Professor of Economics at George Mason University, Professor Daniel Klein. Um, he holds degrees from George Mason University and New York University, and his work focuses on economic principles, public policy issues, and the liberal tradition of Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek. He has published research on a variety of policy issues, including but not limited to toll roads, urban transit, auto emission, credit reporting, and the Food and Drug Administration. Lately, his research dwells on Adam Smith. He and Russ Roberts produced a multi-part audio book club on the theory of moral sentiments. He is the chief editor of Econ Journal Watch, an online journal ded dedicated to economics. He is the co-author of Curb Rights, a foundation for free enterprise and urban transit, uh, editor of Reputation, Studies in the Voluntary Elicitation of Good Conduct, and editor of What Do Economists Contribute, among many others. He has co-authored with Alex Tabar? Tabarok. Um, on an extensive website on the Food and Drug Administration, fdareview.org, and his new book is entitled Knowledge and Coordination, a Liberal Interpretation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Daniel Klein. Good evening. Thanks for being here, and thanks Portia and Praxis and others for having me out here. It's my first time here to the famed Hillsdale College. <laughs> I grew up in a town in New Jersey called Hillsdale, New Jersey. So this feels like home. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't know if some of you know Professor Michael Clark. He's uh, one of the students. <laughs> makes me so proud. Uh, I, was, I was one of his teachers at George Mason. Anyway, um, I have a paper to tell you about. It's co-authored with an undergraduate at George Mason, Will Fleming, who's much better with computers than I am. Um, <clears throat> the origins of the use of liberal in a political sense of the term. William Robertson and Adam Smith. We'll get back to William Robertson and Adam Smith to, well, Smith, the great giant with David Hume of the Scottish Enlightenment. William Robertson's also of the Scottish Enlightenment, but much less well known. And I don't even know that much about him, to tell you the truth. That's the thing with search engines now. You can dig what you want from these people without even bothering to making an acquaintance with them sometimes. <laughs> um, Smith I'm more acquainted with. Now let's see if this works. I'll try that. Okay. You know about liberal. You know how this, these words work probably brought up hearing all about it. Um, you can't escape it. Um, I want to talk about this word and its history. It's one part of this lecture is about how liberal used to mean something else. <clears throat> I think it's really important to know that history or know something about that history and to realize that the way we talk now in a lot of ways is, is, is very, very um, contorted, you might say. But that's Rachel Maddow. This is Paul Krugman's book. You know about them. And not only do they call themselves liberal, but others who don't like them call them liberal, like Sean Hannity and Jonah Goldberg with his book, Liberal Fascism. <coughs> Got a lot of good material in that book, by the way, if you haven't read it. I don't like the way he, go, he goes with the liberal talk, but um, I have a lot of admiration for that book. <clears throat> so this is sort of the legend of what the words so often really mean. You know, we have a two-party system, and that's the way the drama and soap opera works in a country with a two-party system and everyone gets absorbed into it, and then words get attached, code words, really, to the brawl, the big, great brawl. Um, and that's sort of what these two words really mean, identifiers for the political parties. <clears throat> so I want to look at the history of this word liberal. And this is a chart of the use of the word in books using Google's Google Books Ngram viewer, what 
this is charting on the vertical axis is the percent of the time that a word in a book published in each year is the word liberal. So it's a very, very tiny percent, but what matters is the trend over time. And this shows you that the word has been around for a long time. It goes back before 1600. So it wasn't a word that just became into fashion when liberalism as a political philosophy started. It was a word that had other uses. And using another tool, we can figure out what those uses were. So this is for the last 30 years or 29 years. I guess it's 30 years of what I just showed you. And this shows you with the biggest to the smallest of the noun collocate that went with the adjective liberal. Liberal education, liberal arts, liberal arts with a capital A, <laughs> liberal sciences, liberal hand, liberal rewarder, liberal kind, liberal heir, liberal endowments. And this is up to 1769, and I guess the point here, the important point here, is that none of these are really particularly about politics. It's not that being used in a political way, the word liberal. What it meant was generous, um, or maybe pertaining to certain occupations and ways of life, maybe particularly among city folks who did certain liberal arts and crafts and pursued certain liberal studies. So we don't really see politics here. It's very scarcely used as a political signifier. Now that changes right about at the end of that period. It's right about 1769, 1770. How do we know that? Because now we have engrams of these expressions. Liberal system is this dark blue one here. I think that's this one. So that's a called a two gram. A two gram is a string of two words like Michael Clark is a two gram. You can, you can chart that, by the way, on the Google Engram viewer, Michael Clark. <laughs> and it'll show up even. Um, but the liberal system is a two gram, and again, we have the percentage of all two grams, such as white room or dirty carpet and all the others, the percent of all the two grams that are liberal system. It didn't exist before 1770 or so. Liberal system is a political usage. It's a political system. Liberal principles, liberal plan, liberal views, liberal ideas, liberal policy. These are all starting right here. So there's something happening right about here. Now, before we go back and look at what's <coughs> happening here and how this gets started, I want to kind of move fast forward through history again, to, to, just to kind of run us back up to today, and then go back and look at that period, the origination. So what happens is that this starts catching on, and liberal starts being a term that means something to people, and they start using these terms for that meaning, but then what else comes a couple decades after that? What do you think happens to these as we go further? What else is going to grow here? Anybody? A different noun. See, instead of policy, ideas, views, plans, principles, system, another word comes in to kind of scoop up all that action, liberalism. Here, liberalism is born, okay? And it comes out of these early uses of liberal system, liberal plan, liberal principles, liberal policy. Then people start saying ism, and that gets the action, and it grows as we get a liberal party <coughs> in Britain representing that very philosophy. So that's why these kind of taper off, because now you can just say liberalism, okay? 
<clears throat> so what was this? This is Gladstone, Liberal Prime Minister of Britain, four times of the Liberal Party. Now, do you think he was like Paul Krugman? <laughs> no. These guys were for free trade, free markets, low taxes, small government generally, eliminating and removing privileges for the upper classes. Basically, you know, what we call today, I don't know what we call today. Some people call it conservatism, some people call it libertarianism, some people call it classical liberalism. And I'd still call it liberalism. I'll sort of won't give up. It's one of those dogs that won't let go. Um, this is an essay from 1823, one of the first uses of the term liberalism. The Liberal Party, though, doesn't really get power until the 1860s. And it becomes a big force in Britain. And that's really what cemented the term liberal in the original sense of the term. And it was a sense which does go back, as we'll see, to that 1770s start. Here's a quote from today, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. <clears throat> For classical liberals, sometimes called the old liberalism, liberty and private property are intimately related. From the 18th century right up to today, classical liberals have insisted that an economic system based on private property is uniquely consistent with individual liberty, allowing each to live her life, including employing her labor and her capital, as she sees fit. Um, indeed, classical liberals and libertarians have often asserted that in some way liberty and property are really the same thing, <clears throat> and so on. A market order based on private property is thus seen as an embodiment of freedom. This is a fine definition, and it's right there in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy today. So it's not like we're making this up. This, this, this authoritative source is telling us that this is what the old liberalism was from the 18th century to today. So when you hear people like me, and they talk about liberalism and classical liberalism, they're not making that up. They're really not. We real, it's real, liberalism, the arc of liberalism, <coughs> particularly coming out of the 18th century and into the 19th century, is sort of the great movement and experience, if you like, of Western civilization. I'm not saying there wasn't a lot of good stuff before that, and I'm not saying that liberalism didn't have roots, of course, going all much further back. But in some sense, it comes out in an explicit way and in a whole system of thought and language that dramatically changes the world and the way people think. Have you ever heard about Deirdre McCloskey's hockey stick? About the hockey stick? It's this. It's the timing of this. Her explanation for the Industrial Revolution is that liberalism morally authorized the pursuit of honest income and free market policy. And then we got a hockey stick, right? This is the liberal experience. <coughs> And I know a lot of you think Rachel Maddow, and it's, you know, you're like maybe pushing this away. But really, this is real. And Rachel, Rachel Maddow and Paul Krugman, they're not real. <laughs> Sean Hannity, when he talks about his opponents as liberals, to me, that's not real. This is real. Whoops. There we go. This is just a nut. Uh, well, back here was another source from the Columbia Encyclopedia. I won't trouble you with that. Um, this are some of the people who are great figures in the history of, of liberalism. Many of these people were liberals when liberalism was called liberalism. Some of these people are from later periods when liberalism was not necessarily called liberalism. But they nonetheless still continue to call themselves liberal like Friedrich Hayek, who must be here somebody, or Milton Friedman, or Ludwig von Mises, or many others. He used the term classical liberalism, Buchanan. There's Friedman up there. Here's Deirdre. We should do, do a test how many faces you can name. <laughs> um, anyway, a lot of great figures here. There's Adam <coughs> there. This is 
Rose Friedman, by the way. Um, okay. And then came the new liberalism. This was at the end of the eight, of the of the nineteenth century. Right, or, it, it, this start really starts around eighteen eighty, but the terminology of liberalism is really starts to be seen as changing more around nineteen hundred in Britain. Okay, you got to realize America is kind of a follower nation during this period, this whole period, up well into the twentieth century. Um, and you got guys like Hobhouse and Hobson saying, oh, the old liberalism, that was for another time and different conditions. And we're not necessarily saying that, you know, those <coughs> policies and attitudes didn't make sense then, but now things are different and we're richer and we figured out how to master industry and production and such. Um, and we need to spread the wealth. And that's what liberalism is today. And it turns out to be a different set of policies. Um, this, this right here is, I think, Hobhouse or Hobson. How am I even sure? It doesn't, didn't reproduce very well. But um, they're explicitly calling it the new liberalism. Here's a quote from someone not sympathetic to it from 1922. The new liberalism, therefore, starts with the assumption that it is the duty of the state to secure for all its citizens such conditions of life as will make real liberty possible. Intellectually, Mr. Muir is the heir of Sismondi and Michael Sadler, the foes of historic liberalism. And the liberalism which he proclaims is indebted less to the precepts of Smith and Ricardo than to the theories of guild socialists and even state socialists. So liberalism, something, a different philosophy, steals the name, in a sense. This was an earlier writer sort of suggesting why the Liberal Party in Britain perhaps started making this change. The exclusion of the Liberal Party from power seems likely to be indefinitely prolonged unless, indeed, the leaders of the Liberal Party adequately recognize the transformation of the old into the new liberalism and adopt their policies to the requirements of the people. This quote suggests that there was some sort of movement of times of, of, of throughout society in general, which in a sense demanded collectivism, statism. And if the Liberal Party didn't start giving people that tune and those policies, they would lose power. And I think there's probably a lot to that. So it's not all just driven by a few like wayward party leaders who sort of took the party and the liberal name down the wrong path. I think they're also responding to something broader and more bottom up at the same time. It's a very large question. Why did liberalism change? Why did this whole thing happen? <clears throat> Why did, as it were, Western civilization go off course. Now, this is, shows you real clear that this was happening. Again, these, these engram tools are just wonderful. People start talking about the new liberalism, the blue line. They need to distinguish between the new and the old. And you see it right there in the data. And as well, the old liberalism. I've put a scalar on this just to get them about the same size, but you can see the trend, which is what's significant. Okay. And by the way, these are words in books, and you see it starting here around 1910. This is really a starting in journals, which are not in this data earlier. So I, I would date this whole thing earlier than it looks right there. You know, it might take some years for people to kind of sort of catch on to talk this way and publish it in a book as the old liberalism and the new liberalism. Now, liberal isn't the only word that changed or lost meaning. I would say that the most important words of our civilization changed or lost meaning. All of these words, I think, were tending towards a sort of a classical liberal understanding. That is to say, people's understanding of these words was tending towards a classical liberal meaning. 
and all of these words, these are the jewels of Western civilization right here. These are, this is, we're talking about the semantics of our civilization, the most important words of the modern world. And they all, I would say, systematically either changed meaning or just kind of got diluted and lost meaning because of this fundamental change that occurred beginning, I would, I would take the change from 1880 to 1940. After that, it sort of was written. And the Liberal Party does change its tune and starts doing policies that are collectivist and welfare statist and interventionist. And this cements in the idea that liberalism now means something closer to say, the New Deal. And so in the, in the 30s, liberal starts getting attached to the Democratic Party, and the whole New Deal progressive outlook gets more, more clearly attached to the Democratic Party. And that pretty much brings us down to today. That's pretty much how it's gone since. So in some sense, we're still living in the, the, the conditions of this t tidal change that occurred 100 years ago. And we're still kind of grappling with having had our whole vocabulary pulled out from under us. <clears throat> Unfortunately. All right. Well, that's pretty much the depressing story. <laughs> oh, no, no, I just wanted this as kind of a follow up. So this helps us understand a little bit why a word like libertarian comes into being and gains usage. Because you can't say liberal anymore. And to say classical liberal, well, that, that's what people did too, actually. <laughs> Uh, but it's a mouthful, that's the liberal. And I can't go backwards with this thing. So some people did. <clears throat> some people did it with libertarian. Okay. I don't know how to do this quite. Sorry. Yeah, here I can go backwards. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to go back to that 1770 and take a close look there. Because that's what got started, the original liberalism. The, the, the Gladstonian good liberalism was true to what got started here in the 1770 or so. But look, before kind of delving into that, should I, do you have any questions about this sort of grand story before we look specifically at William Robertson and Adam Smith? Anybody got questions or comments? Yes, sir. You showed trends of the words libertarian and uh, phrase classical liberal as opposed to just uh, mere liberal or just in general. Yeah. Are these, these seem like sort of substitutes for liberalism. Are they the same or are there real differences between the two? Is there a difference between libertarian and old liberal? Mm -hmm. I would, well, there is some difference, I would say. Um, it's, it's kind of a matter of emphasis uh, because some you got groups of people under each heading, but the proportions change of what type within the people under the heading maybe swell or shrink. And I do think that modern libertarianism, Rothbardian libertarianism, is something fairly distinctive, not, not like fundamentally different from the old liberal, at least not in terms of its policy outlook, policy agenda, but in its mode of thinking, I would say it's, it's kind of distinct, somewhat distinctive from at least the British trend of liberalism. Um, so there's some difference. There's some differences. I mean, I mean, you know, ideas develop and every age has sort of different tendencies in its thinking. The 20th century, you know, has a lot of bad tendencies. It's not just Murray Rothbard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, this is probably, people who call themselves classical liberal probably are more like the 19th and 20th century British liberals. Does that help? Anything else just about all this? Yeah. Uh, are there big distinctions between the term liberal in the United States and liberal in European countries? And so why is it this? 
Um, you mean are there differences today yeah, in how yeah, the word is used? Yeah, liberal, like if we were to say I'm a liberal here in the United States, yeah. that was to say to a, a Brit, hey, I'm a liberal. Right. Would that mean the same thing to them? Um, Britain's in between, and if you go further to Central Europe and elsewhere around the world, liberal still means liberal. Uh, so it kind of depends on where you are. Um, we're sort of part of the Anglophonic community, and Britain and Australia and stuff, liberalism to them can still mean old liberal, but it can also mean sort of Paul Krugman and such. So it's kind of in between. And basically, uh, I think the further east you go, the more that, and, may, and probably the further south you go in Europe too, the more that liberal still means Gladstone and Adam Smith as it were, okay? Uh, so yeah, I mean, this isn't just archaic, like once we talk this way, a lot of the world still talks this way, absolutely. Yeah. What do you think caused the hijacking of the word liberal? And I mean in the US, but more in Britain. What caused it? Well, that's a huge, huge question. And I don't have any simple answer to it. I don't even have any complex, I don't have a good complex answer to it. It's a huge, huge question. Uh, it has been addressed in a lot of different ways, partially. Um, actually, democracy has a big role in it, and the spread of democracy, and how democracy fundamentally, and the idea of universal suffrage, how the spread of that fundamentally changes people's thinking about their relationship to the government. Rather than being oh, a bunch of aristocrats who sort of are out there and might lord it over us, sort of people apart from us who might encroach on our liberties and abuse us, it becomes, oh, we are the government. We all vote. This is the public will. And now that everyone has the vote, it's ratified as consensual because of democracy. This movement lends itself to thinking of the polity as a kind of club that we collectively own. Okay, and then how are we going to collectively manage this club? Oh, we'll democratically elect officers who will then make rules, like the minimum wage, say. And it's all voluntary. If you don't like it, you're free to leave the club. No one's stopping you from leaving the country. It's kind of a model of the country as a hotel of sorts, democratically controlled and, and as it were, collectively owned. So democracy is an important part of this. And if you think about the timing of um, the spread of the vote, you know, it's very much, well, what, what, what picture do we want to look at here? Um, it's very much like this, growing here and spreading here. This is, this is sort of like the big spread of suffrage you say and the idea of the ethic of democracy. Would you say World War I helped contribute to that? Because that's when there was a big spike just prior to. Um, I'm not sure that World War I, I, th I see the movement as having much deeper and broader, <coughs> a deeper and broader tide before World War I. Uh, things like World War I certainly didn't help. But um, I see something happening much deeper and earlier. In some ways, it could be that you know the Liberal Party had power, and people were living then with liberal liberal governments and liberal politicians, and they got up out of their bed that morning and said, "You know what? I'm still not happy. <laughs> this isn't what it's cracked up to be. So I have to keep searching. I, you know, I really don't know. It's a very big question. Um, but something to totally profound happened a hundred years ago." All right, and if there's no other questions, I, I'll, I'll go on to look at that origination. So this we saw before, I just want to show you again. What's going on here? What's getting started? And Google Books allows you to drill into the actual texts that this is plotting. And these two guys seem to be really significant in starting this political use of, usage of the adjective liberal. Um, he's a historian, 
at Edinburgh. Uh, he, he's a moral philosopher, and that includes political economy. Um, he taught at Glasgow, although he moved to Edinburgh later in his life. And let's look first at Robertson. So in, some, in 1769, uh, he publishes this history of the reign of Charles, Emperor Charles V, and he, start, he starts using liberal in this way. Um, speaking of intro, someone introducing more just and liberal ideas concerning the nature of government and the administration of justice. I won't read all these quotes. They're in the handout if you've got a copy. I'll maybe look at a couple of them. What's nice about these two quotes from Robertson, this is again 1769, is that he directly links uh, the word liberal with principles of liberty and spirit of liberty. This helped <coughs> within the word liberal. You know, this, this helps to illustrate the reality of what classical liberalism was and the integrity of it. Um, Some more examples, and he was friends with Smith. And in a, in a letter to Smith, which, which he concludes, I should, this is right after The Wealth of Nations comes out, he's like congratulating his friend Smith on it. He ends by saying, I shall often follow you as my guide and instructor on political economy and public policy. And he speaks of the, of the bad ones as the illiberal in this personal correspondence with Smith. So we're just seeing we're just seeing where this comes from, um, and then in his book on the on America, I almost said the United States, <coughs> on America. Um, again, the usage this way is quite prominent. Okay, there's some thought that he attended Smith Smith's lectures, and that maybe. Actually, he picked up some of this from Smith before Smith put it in print, his liberal talk, particularly in The Wealth of Nations, because The Wealth of Nations comes after the 1769 Robertson. But we're not sure. But then, you know, it's possible. But then it's in Smith, and Smith is huge. Smith is a cultural icon of his day. He's a, a royalty figure in terms of culture and philosophy. In his times, he's like the peak of the Scottish Enlightenment. And the Scottish Enlightenment, the mountain of the Scottish Enlightenment, he's like at the peak. Adam Smith's the most revered, most respected within that circle. And that whole mountain is one of the great mountains of all of culture and philosophy in Europe. So it's a big deal when Smith starts doing this. And like he, he tells about. Colbert, the minister of Louis XIV, the industry and commerce of a great country, he, Colbert, endeavored to regulate upon the same model as the departments of a public office. In other words, he tried to run the economy like it was an organization. And instead of allowing every man to pursue his own interest, his own way, upon the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice, he bestowed upon certain branches of industry extraordinary privileges, while he laid others under an extra, as extraordinary restraints. Very significant passage there, where he's contrasting the liberal plan with this organizational central planning kind of plan. And, and here he speaks of the laissez-faire physiocrats, also French, but different from Colbert, these were friends of Smith. He says, according to this liberal and generous system, therefore, the most advantageous method in which a landed nation can raise up artificers and manufacturers and merchants of its own is to grant the most perfect freedom of trade to the artificers, manufacturers, and merchants of all other nations. <coughs> so he's, he's, usually, he's very clearly using the word liberal to mark his own system his own philosophy. Uh, again, this was about the physiocrat. <coughs> its doctrine seemed to be in every respect as just as it is, as it is generous and liberal. 
here again, he summarizes principles as liberal principles. Um, so Smith, I think, is really the major figure, just because he is such a major, major figure. And if he starts doing this, and he, you know, he, Wealth and Nations put it together as an agenda and a philosophy. He really put it together. I mean, not that the idea of free trade what didn't exist before him, but it was like a comprehensive treatment of public policy, the Wealth of Nations. And what's he do? He shows that by and large what you want to do is follow the liberty principle. So he kind of gives you this whole authoritative, super respective, respected system. And he just, his stature just grows even greater. It was great after theory of moral sentiments, but after Wealth of Nations it's even greater. And he's kind of articulated this great system. And what he's doing in those passages is sort of saying liberal is the name of the system. And that's what comes. That's exactly what followed. This guy, I think, was inter instrumental in promulgating this. He <coughs> followed, he, he, was, he, he was a student of Smith's, and he became moral philosophy professor in, at, at Edinburgh, I think. Yeah, Edinburgh. Um, uh, very big deal in his day, um, with a lot of famous students, as this quote uh, says. And another quote here, this is from the 1911 <coughs> Encyclopedia Britannica, names some of his famous students. I don't know how familiar, I, I'm not, a lot of these names aren't familiar to me, but I do know some of them. And in particular, this one right here, he's very influential. He's buddies, he's very, and he's the father of John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill basically follows his thinking. So the idea that Smith kind of started using liberal, we'll see that Stuart promulgates that use and teaches it to his students like Mill, who then teaches it to his son, and that's the heart and heyday of British liberalism. Okay? So we're kind of tracing. So in Dugald Stewart's account of Adam Smith's life and works, he repeatedly uses liberal in this way. It marks the book quite consistently. Again, kind of like cementing in this term. And so after, after Robertson and then Smith, let's look at that 20 year period, a 30 year period. And now, this is an order, descending order of what noun is being modified by liberal. Now, look, policy is showing up quite high on the list. <coughs> I mean, it doesn't look like a lot here. It's here, it's 3%. But, you know, it was zero. And now it's 3%. So you can really see it growing. Policy, <coughs> what else are principles is showing. And again, it might be just 2%. But that's 2% of a big number. And it's starting to make its place. And then another 30 years forward, policy. 5%, liberal policy. Principles, now 4%. This, is, this corresponds to that rise we saw before in the n-gram chart. Um, so, as I say, I think that's kind of how you account for our got started. Robertson and Smith and Dugald Stewart, uh, I'm sure there's some more to the story than that, but I bet you that that's the main part of the story. And that becomes liberalism. That brings us back to our whole story and the tragic confusion and the mess we're in today. And here I just want to note that there's still some people that you can't read this here, but this is the Journal of the Institute of Economic Affairs in London, great, great think tank. And they call their journal a journal of liberal, liberal political economy. And here's my book. I use the term liberal, a liberal interpretation. Here's, um, uh, gosh, what, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, I'm forgetting his name now. But he called his book Liberalism and Cronyism. Um, and uh, he means liberal in the old sense. He says either you have sort of a private enterprise, 
free market economy, <coughs> or you don't. And if you don't, whatever you call it, it turns into cronyism. Because once you governmentalize social affairs, they got no way to do it but through familiarity and friendship and, you know, relying on cronies. Uh, so you do see, again, still today, some people using liberal in the old sense of even in this country. And I think that's all I've got prepared. Yeah. Oh, just, 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 just to give you an idea of how important Adam Smith is today, sorry, um, this is a survey of economics professors from 2010, and they were asked who their favorite pre-20th century economists were, and you can see how much Adam Smith dominates that. And this preference for Smith, this liking for Smith, isn't just the libertarians and the republicans. He's number one for the economists who vote democratic and those who vote green. So Smith is this big hallowed figure, not only for conservatives and libertarians. He's like a really big figure. So if we, if we can say, hey look, liberalism is the philosophy of Adam Smith, and then have the argument, okay, what was Adam Smith's philosophy? I think that we, that would be, put us in a great shape, because I think we can, we can kind of win that argument. <laughs> uh, anyhow, so, questions, yeah? Um, could you explain what sort of left-leaning economists would say that his philosophy is in differentiation? Yeah, there are a number, there, there, there are quite a number of Smith scholars who give Smith a kind of left reading as though he would be sympathetic to modern social democracy, liberalism, as Rachel Maddow would call it. Um, and uh, I, don't, I, I don't think they're on very strong ground at all about, with that, um, but they, they make their case, um, and I think they overstate their case greatly. It's clear that Smith's not like a 100% uh, libertarian, uh, and so in that sense they see, like we were talking about earlier, they see that he's not what they think of as their opponents, but what they think of as their opponents is just a figment of their own imagination anyway, and so they think somehow that proves that Smith's with him, with them, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, look, Smith did endorse a number of exceptions to the liberty principle. For, now, all of the exceptions, Mike Clark wrote his dissertation about this, all of the exceptions pretty much are endorsements of existing status quo interventions of his day. He was not a guy who wanted to go to war con too consistently with the status quo, swinging this axe, this rationalist axe of the liberty principle. Hey, if there's any restrictions out there, you know, I'm Murray Rothbard and I'm going to swim away, right? <laughs> and he didn't, I think that he didn't, uh, he, he, he really didn't want to, I, I think he genuinely believed that, you know, the status quo shouldn't be reformed necessarily too rapidly and too dramatically. Um, but also I think he may have just downplayed to some extent how much reform he wanted because he didn't want to scare people off, as it were. This is pretty much the, the thesis of Michael's dissertation at this point here. So you can ask him to elaborate on that. Yeah. I think that Hayek once called himself not a classical liberal, but an old Whig. Yeah. Could, can you explain that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's funny. We, we asked that, we, we kicked this around uh, recently at the Adam Smith Reading Group. No, I'm really not so sure what, what exactly uh, to make of that old wig thing. Um, and, and you know, Hayek was a liberal. I mean, you know, he, he often declared, propounded, embraced that term and promoted that term. I mean, he, was, he saved classical liberalism. So what do you think, given this story, yeah. what do you think the relevance is for the students here, like going forth with studies, using the term in everyday life? Yeah. What's like the, um, so what can I do? 
Yeah. I, I guess my plea to everybody here is actually to call Rachel Maddow and Paul Krugman social democrats, like the Social Democratic Party of Sweden. That's really the mentality. And you, you see, I think by allowing them to have the word liberal, they are dressing themselves in the greatest nobility and virtue of Western civilization. The word liberal has roots and cognates of liberty and tolerance and the whole history of the good stuff. And if you let them have liberal, you're letting them have, in some sense, the whole ball game. And it's killed us. It's absolutely killed us. So look, maybe you still want to call yourself a conservative. I invite you to think of yourself calling yourself a liberal or a classical liberal. But actually, try not to call Paul Krugman a liberal, <laughs> for my sake. <laughs> I don't know. Is that do, do you buy into the? We heard a couple of my students listen to a thing that was actually like George Mason, where McCloskey was there. Yeah. And she said, maybe it's time for us to steal it back because it's now kind of a swear word. Do you buy into that approach? Um, I mean, uh, that's you know the end game. You know, here's my book. I'm I'm using it. I'm doing it. I'm <laughs> it out. I'm going down with the ship. Um, I mean. If we couldn't steal it back, you know, I'm not sure that we're in any position to steal something back, unfortunately. But I don't know, what are we in a position to do? Really? Yeah. What do you think of the term progressive and progressivism? And progressivism is bad. <laughs> that's never been that's always been bad. Okay. It's bad and, and so it's always been bad. We can let the Yeah. Call them progressives if you like. Social if you don't Democrat. like social democrat, call them progressives. That's grand. <laughs> <laughs> That's grand. Uh, the only thing is, a more establishment democrat type, in some sense, might legitimately say, no, progressive means a little bit more of one of these more hippie types who's like more pro-immigration than the rest of us establishment democrats and more anti-military than the rest of us establishment. So you get a little bit of that problem. But social democrat can be very establishment. I mean, they're governing parties in Europe, you know. Um, earlier today, Dr. Pongrasik told us to refer to uh, liberals, the left, if you will, as pinko commies. Stick by it. No, I, I mean, so, you know, if you, if, you, if, you tell, if you say to Paul Krugman, you know, social Democrats like you, Paul, it's not like Paul Krugman is going to say, oh, no, I'm not a social. He will say he's a social Democrat. You see? He, he's not going to say I'm a pinko commie. <laughs> that's why social Democrat is a good fit. A social Democrat has always been that. Um, yeah, that's what I often use as social Democrat. Social democratic, yeah. Can we please use the term statist? <laughs> sometimes I use the term statist, and, and sometimes that's the most fitting thing. Um, it's not, it's, there's different varieties of that, yeah, of course, that, but there's different fine. varieties of social democracy. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we've been in a big word problem for over 100 years. <laughs> we've been floundering for 100 years. I, I, I mean it. I mean it. And in a way, every time Bill O'Reilly pounds somebody in those stupid liberals, he's like exacerbating our problem. I don't, you know, maybe his point is fine, but it's a sh I think it's kind of a shame that so, so many people have conceded <laughs> that to them. Yeah. You said new liberalism took off as a term in the 1930s. And yeah. I assume some no. of that had to do with FDR's you know, expansion of the four new freedoms. Whatever yeah. that was, including freedom from law, which, you know, yeah. we can assume fed the welfare state. Um, yeah. The, the new liberalism terminology was, was British and earlier. Right, yeah. But then liberal then got America. attached to the 30s FDR, yeah. And it would be odd to, like, take the notion of freedom and then expand it to new realms like freedom from law and then ignore like the core freedoms that classical liberals were known for, such as property. Do you think 
uh, these new liberals or social democrats retain any of those, like such as, I mean, freedom, freedom of speech we have some common ground on, but others? Um, well, social democrats, uh, in, in this country at least, the Democratic Party, at least the, the economists, they, they would be like, they're generally pro-free trade, <coughs> Uh, so there are some things that uh, they do favor liberty in, certainly. And, you know, the Democrats, I don't know, the average Democrat versus the average Republican on, on drugs, drug liberalization, and some of the other things, uh, you know, might be a draw or something. Um, but I, to go back to your point about expanding the idea of freedom, I don't think that's... That's very much part of what happened 100 years ago, is words like freedom got turned inside out. And it doesn't really hold up as meaningful when you expand it so much. And by expanding it, you do sort of eclipse that older core meaning, more precise meaning, I would say, a more tangible meaning of freedom, like someone messing with your stuff. And so when you lose sight of that and you let people get away from that and violate that without actually facing up to violating that, which they do with all this intervention and regulation, um, something really important is lost. If I didn't use the term stretch uh, in Pacific Span, I, I meant to, whereas, yeah. you know, to spread it to another area, it yeah. thins out. Yeah. In the yeah, yeah. And it really corrupts it sort of especially when they're not willing to kind of make a point of keeping the other two, as they did it. So this is not something I'm certainly an expert on, but my impression was for a long time that the transition from old liberalism to new liberalism had a bit to do with uh, one of your slides where you started pointing out that uh, many of the terms started changing definitions. And I always thought it was really one of the, the, the two most important terms were equality and justice. Uh -huh. So whereas equality and justice were very much um, at the heart of the liberal project from the beginning. Right. And it, it, what it meant is that everybody would be um, operating under the same rules. <coughs> there would be no special treatment of this group or that group, right? It started then becoming um, used in a more distributive sense. Right, so um, equality of outcome, equality of income. Yeah. Uh, and that's how yeah. old liberalism morphed into new liberalism, is that people started pushing these themes, in particular these two themes of equality and justice, to a place where classical liberals certainly would not have gone. But they thought that they were still being consistent with the I old ideas. Do you have an, any thoughts on that? I think that's right, except I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't view that development as like the key to it. I think it's, I think that kind of development you see with all of these, um, and it's all part of this whole kind of, uh, if you like, paradigm shift, okay, about who, about, almost about meaning in life. Um, you know, politics is a great is is really about people looking for meaning, I think. Um, and so, yes, partly they looked for meaning with this new idea of now the nation state, the democratic nation state, democratically governed, of us taking care of us. It's a very inclusive, warm and fuzzy <coughs> idea. Us taking care of us. And it's almost like the enterprise, the efforts, right, of us taking care of us, which is almost actually the real purpose, the real appeal. Whether or not people actually end up better fed or better educated, that's almost secondary. That's gravy if you get it. But look, we tried, we pulled together, us taking care of us. And that whole us taking care of us, which Hayek, in many important works, associates as having to do with our Paleolithic back of the small band, where we were very solidaric 
you know, very consensus oriented. <coughs> Basically, we were packs of like 25 people, equals, a first among equals as among a motorcycle gang, right? Or any other gang of 25 people. A first among equals, but equals, familiars. Anybody could kill anybody, as <laughs> Travis Bickle puts it in Taxi Driver. Um, but this idea, this mental change of politics and the polity of sort of like us, part of the nation state, you know, Tocqueville saw this coming when he talked about the kind of tyranny that we had to fear in democracy. Um, so I think that what you're saying is part of it, but I don't, necess I don't really necessarily believe that Paul Krugman is so worried about equality or so worried about how somebody has less than somebody else. He wants to, us to take care of us. You know what I mean? <clears throat> He I likes think he that would whole. Say that he's very worried about it. Oh, I know he would. But. <laughs> I mean, that's. I think that's basically the heart of modern liberalism. There's like a collective romance in this idea, and that the whole notion of sort of enjoying and being gratified in that collective romance didn't really come until we had the, the almost universal suffrage, democratic nation state. Um, and maybe the machinery of government to pretend that it can actually do this through governmentalization, the collective taking care of itself collectively. So, so social democracy and socialism, they do have a common history. That's one of the great things about that Goldberg book, is he shows how much national socialism and Mussoliniism are very much of the left. And this us taking care of us, this collectivist, yearning, which again, Hayek associates with evolution and our genes. And I, I like this theory. Um, you know, our genes haven't changed much in the last 10,000 years. We've become more lactose tolerant. We've become a little brighter. But otherwise, they haven't changed that much in the last 10,000 years. And 10,000 years ago, we were ending millions of years of living in small bands. That's what we've been bred into. And when this political attitude and outlook came, this is Hayek's theory, not mine, of we have the polity and now we can act like it's the band and do those band mentalities and meanings. I think that's kind of what's happened. And, it, and, it, and it's like a systematic subversion of this classical liberal arc that came out of the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Yeah. Uh, did you ask a question already? No. Okay. Go ahead. Um, how liberal would you say is, uh, say, Rothbardian anarchism, uh, specifically the subdivision of anarcho-capitalism uh, represented by Hoppe, which uh, tends to say the natural ally of uh, classical liberalism, as it were, uh, is um, a aristocratic or monarchical type state, so allying classical liberalism with classical conservatism, almost about. How liberal is Rothbardian anarchism? That's a good question. I don't know. I, 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 it's not my reservations about preaching and branding and thinking of Rothbardian anarchism aren't so much that it's illiberal as much as it's, um, I'm happy to talk about abolishing government agencies and government interventions, but I like to abolish one per conversation. <laughs> you know, and I'd rather like have separate serial conversations where we abolish these, rather than like push, you know, bang and all one button, like blow it up all in one button. It's just, it's like talking about a change that's so dramatic that, um, I'm not even sure, you know, how you can talk about the desirability of it. It's very hard to imagine the world in which this thought experiment, like we can, we can do a thought experiment of repealing pre-market approval of pharmaceuticals. Okay, pre-market approval, that's Orwell <coughs> to speak, for banned until individually permitted by the FDA. Because we had that. We, we had a world without that not that long ago, 
And we can easily imagine people going about their business every day in a world without pre-market approval, and we can have that conversation. What kind of world is it where somehow like all of government gets, gets eradicated somehow? Uh, I don't know. I just, I just have trouble finding the meaning of the words and the thought experiments that, for that kind of exercise. So I'm just not that. And government, <clears throat> another thing about Rothbardianism is I believe that there is at least one necessary and important function for government. And that is dismantling other functions of government. <laughs> How are you going to dismantle functions of government except by government? And so this Rothbardian attitude of sort of like, oh, all the bastards be damned. No, <laughs> um, it just doesn't make sense to me as a enterprise of scholarship, of discourse. Uh, I don't know. So I have problems. I, you know, I, I'm not like, uh, I think it's interesting stuff, but uh, I'm not that jazzed by <laughs> anarchism talk. Nor was Smith and Hume. They saw that there was a conventionalist thing about government uh, that you had to kind of face up as probably pretty inevitable. And what we want to do is try to manage it. We run out of time. Um, I, we should definitely continue questions. I just want to feel, um, begin to go. Feel free. You want to honor your time, so um, don't feel too rude if you got to head out. Yeah. Um, but do stick around. Um, for more questions, and we may move to AJ's if, if people are interested in talking. Talk to Clay not only about the topic tonight, but also about grad school. He's very knowledgeable about that, um, very knowledgeable about Austrian economics and Smith in general. Um, and he's also selling his book. So, big discount here. Yeah.